All right, today's guest is someone that was a huge cult hero when he was playing rugby league. He played 210 NRL games, he played 42 games in England for the Rhinos, played for Cronulla, represented Australia, played for the Tigers. He also represented New South Wales. He's also a good mate. And one thing that I love about Keith is when he was a cult hero, what he was known for was the no-nonsense approach. Everyone loved him because he was just an up-and-down man. He, he wore his heart on his sleeve, and he gave it absolutely everything he had. And one thing, I was a huge fan of Keith's, and it's just a, it's a pleasure to have you here today, Keith. And one thing I want to start with is the cult hero tag. I know Phil Gould was a massive fan of yours. Why, why did you... What, what, how did you get that term and that, that name, cult hero? And what was it that you done that gave you that? Yeah, firstly, thanks for the introduction. It was pretty nice of you. Um, I don't know, mate. Maybe it was just my, my size, my height. Um, obviously, having red hair, I had I had hair back then. So, um, plus probably Gus on the on the TV commentary and things he like that. He loved you, so. man. He was like one of your yeah. biggest fans. Yeah, no, he's he's good sort of publisher publicist for me. Yeah. So, obviously, you know, you started your career at, at Cronulla, but let's, let's go a step back. You, you played your, I think, you, you, remind me if I'm correct or not, you played your junior rugby league with the, with the Brighton Seagulls? I started there. So I started the Seagulls. I grew up in Brighton Sands, so that was the local club. Played there for a couple of years, then went over to Mascot, which was just the other side of the airport for about four or five years, and then... But I was about 13, I think it was, and ended up moving in the Cronulla comp, playing over there. So, And that's how I sort of went through the grades at the Sharks. And, like, you're pretty big, right? Were you, did you have that size when you were young? Like, what are you, six foot four, six foot five? Yeah, pretty much six foot four, yeah. I was, I was always a tall kid, eh? So, um, I was always taller. But there, were, there was other big kids too. Um, but I was definitely always the sort of tallest kid. And then I sort of, uh, I was pretty skinny though for a long time and then sort of started filling out. Did you always play in the forwards or were you, was, did you transition? Um, I think early on I sort of thought I was a bit of a playmaker, but um, I was just too big to do that sort of stuff. So I was pretty much a forward early on and pretty much stayed there. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I see in rugby league a lot, obviously you have to be able to train extremely hard. I mean, training in the off-season, the workload, it's, it's brutal, right? And, and playing the game is brutal in itself. What goes through your mind knowing that you got to get to the sessions there and you got to push yourself and you can't let other team members down because if you let them down, you're going to let them down on game day. What's that like going to training and, and really giving it your all? Well, it was just part of the job. You sort of, um, I think ever since I was a kid, I sort of, I wanted to train hard. I always thought, you know, if I'm going to make it, I'm going to train harder than anyone. And once you reach that elite level with all your teammates, I mean, you're going to battle with these guys every week. You don't want to let them down. They become your, they become your best mates. When you're playing first grade, you see these guys more than your family. You're training with them day in day out. Um, you're essentially going to battle with them every weekend. So, um, and you want you want to better yourself, obviously, but you don't want to let your teammate down. I think that was yeah. a big thing, big thing in that culture. Well, the reason I ask that is because, like you know, you're looking at the tabloids today, and people are going to training and they're not putting in that same effort. Was it something that was more prevalent back then that where you are? Where, hey, if you don't train hard, you're not going to be in the team. Was was the standards different then to what it is now? Because now you're seeing like certain teams where they're not putting in that effort, they're not training, or you know, they're, 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 is it a cultural thing? What is it? Yeah, I'm not too sure. I, I can't really speak on how teams are training right now, but I remember coming through the grades, we got we got smashed at training. You know, and if if we didn't if we don't make a time, that's all. You've you've caused the whole team to start again. If you gave up on something, it was on you. You had to make the team start again. You know, if you if you weren't putting effort, the, you know, the coach or the manager or the trainer, sorry, would just go F off, you know, stuff like that. So I think we were brought up pretty tough the way in that footy culture back then. Um, I think it's softened a bit now. Hmm. Obviously, um, it's just how society is now, but yeah. it was definitely a, t- a lot tougher and harder back then. Yeah, Because you, 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 obviously you started in 2005, so you're transitioning through with some of the, the toughest guys in that era of the 90s you know, coming outside of that, you know, 2005 era and you're you're getting to see what it was like and you're hearing more stories. I think today's players don't hear the stories of the ones before that and the ones before that. 
did you guys hear a lot of stories about the, you know the players of the 80s and the 70s where they were they were bred tough and they used to really push through the pain barrier and getting on the field and and even like you know you you've got to play with injuries right yeah do you think more players were playing with more bruises and more bumps back then i think so um uh, to, to be honest, though, these days, I don't think any player halfway through the years feel feel their body feels amazing going into a game. But I remember when I sort of played, um, if you're injured, you couldn't let the other team know. That was just in our that was just in our head that you know never show someone you're hurt. Always mm -hmm. get up and, and battle away. Even concussions, like I, I played some games where I was sort of knocked out, but I didn't want the other team to know. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was I, had, I played one or two games where I didn't even remember the whole game, but I kept playing. So I think. Um, which isn't necessarily a healthy thing or a good thing, hmm. but that was just that was just our our psych back then, you know. Yeah. Play hard. Don't let them know you're injured. Play for play for the pain. That's yeah. how we sort of bred up. And the reason, look, I ask these questions is when I look at anything like in life, whether it's you know my business, my teams, I'm looking at the extras that people and in, individuals put in, and I'm seeing like there's a big sort of gap in between people who have, you know. Uh, these huge goals to become the best they can possibly become. Did you, when you were back in the day, did you go, hey, I'm going to play first grade and I'm going to play 200 games or were you just happy to play one? I just wanted to make it. Um, I knew I had a talent, um, but I knew how hard it was to make it. I, I used to look up at guys, you know, if they'd, a guy that had played, or he, even if he played reserve grade, I'd go, oh, that, that bloke's played for, say, I was a Dragons fan back then. That bloke played for St. George Reserves and things like that. So I just wanted to make it. Um, I put all my emphasis into it into being a rugby league player and uh, luckily I got there. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to make first grade. Which players were kind of your hero when you were coming through? Yeah, probably um, Paul Harrigan, the chief at, at Newcastle. I wasn't a Knights fan, but I just loved how tough he was, how hard he was. Um, young Gordon Tallis of the Dragons, you know, someone like him. And then even when I finally got into first grade at the Sharks, um, like Jason Stevens was there, players like that, you know. Mm -hmm. What were some of your biggest challenges when you – okay, so you went from Cronulla to the Tigers. What was that like and why did you make the the leap to go to the Tigers? Yeah, I was sort of – I'd been at Sharks for a couple of years, um, two or three years, played first grade. I was off contract and then um, I was sort of – there was a few clubs after me, like, you know, a bit, bit of – the money, to be honest, the money was a bit better at the Tigers, just a bit, but there was other clubs offering more money as well. But um, the Tigers were just – well, you saw that crop of players that come through in 05. That ex you know, a few of them were about my age. They, they won the comp. When I signed with them, they had to win the comp because I signed with them halfway through the year. But um, most of these young kids I was playing SG Ball with and Matthews Cup, and I thought, oh, you know, they're, they're going to be good for a long time, this team. And I thought it would be, be a good sort of uh, environment to be in. So I jumped I jumped at the opportunity to go to the Tigers. Tim Sheens was there. You know, he was, he was a pretty – he was well known as a premiership winning coach. I thought um, – Probably the best for my future in rugby league if I went there at the time, yeah. So this 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 alludes me, I guess, to the next question. You're at the Tigers, you've signed and you watch them win the grand final. Mm. You going there, did you think, hey, oh, fuck, this this team looks like they can win a few in a row? And obviously they've done nothing since then. What was it? Yeah, but you guys were like always one game away. You like mm. there was a couple of years there, mm. like you should have won the comp. Yeah. Like, there was, without a shadow of a doubt, that Roosters game. Yeah. So like, yeah. So we obviously they won the comp, but joined the next year. Um, yeah, there was a few injuries. Just we didn't click, you know. And then, um, but I enjoyed it. It was it was a good environment to be in. Um, Two thousand and ten and and eleven, both those years, you know, we were one point from. Two thousand ten, we're one point from the uh, from the grand final. Dragons beat us by a point, and then ended up beating beating Roosters by. Heaps, you know, the next week, and then the ne the year after, Warriors pipped us on the last the last seconds of that game from a crossfield kick, and we missed out. We missed out again. But them two years, we probably should have, uh, could have, should have, you know, won something. What was it like? Because I, I remember those years. Um, it was like you guys had to lose it for yeah. other teams to win. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was I think the style we played, you know, we had the Benji Marshalls, the Robbie Farrers, um, Gareth Ellis was there. We were, it was probably attractive football. People liked watching us play, you know, just the way we threw the ball around and that. But, um, yeah, look, at mate, I still haven't watched those semifinals and all those things, to be honest, because, you know, looking back, you play a long career, 
a lot of blokes like so many guys don't win a comp and that was our chance to, to win something you know we were that close but no uh, just wasn't a big you know if i look at the tigers now uh the culture whatever it is whether it's the management and all that kind of stuff has you know kind of made it hard for the supporters like i'm a manly fan i love rugby league when you played what was it like at the tigers yeah we did um I so said, when you're in that inner, inner sanctum, in a, in a circle, um, mate, to be honest, I, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't really bother about politics and all that sort of crap that happened. I, I, was, I was just there to pay to play, had some good teammates there, some good players, and um, for the most part of it, it, it was good, you know. We had a few we had a few years where we really struggled, but um, right now, it's pretty – obviously, I'm a Tigers fan now because I've spent so many years there. Um, it's hard. It's painful to watch them, you know, the – Tigers are sort of the butt of, butt of all the jokes in the rugby league world and you know what I mean? But it's a good club, you know. There's um, some really good people involved. It's, it's sort of hard to watch. I just I sort of hope they get back on their feet and yeah. get back up there where they belong. I guess that's the question I was going to ask. Is it hard for you to watch um, what's happening at the club, you know, in terms of the CEO with Tim Sheens? Obviously, your good mates, Robbie Farrar and Benji Marshall are there. And you, you always want the best for your mates, right? Mm-hmm. Do you do you watch it and go fuck? I wouldn't like to be there. It's absolutely challenging. Um, what goes through your mind when you see it compared to what it was like for you? Oh mate, like I said, the, those years where we really struggled, we kept losing. Mate, it's, it's not a, it's not an enjoyable place to be. You know, mm. you're losing games. You you know you got to show your head in public. People are going, oh, what's going on with you guys? And the 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 winning culture in rugby league is so much better. Obviously, it's so much better to the losing culture. It's just such a you know when you're winning games, you can't wait to get into training, you can't wait to play, things like that. When you're losing games, you still want to play, and you want to try and prove it wrong. But it's just when it's not happening, it's not happening. So um, I just hope they can turn around. I mean, it's a good club. They've got a strong junior base, especially in that Campbellton region. Yeah. So I think they're really got to hone in on that area and um, get some of these good young kids that other clubs are coming in and stealing, put them in the Tigers pathways and. Um, I think hopefully in the next few years I'll start building building right up again. Well, it's funny because like when you look at rugby league in itself, when the Tigers were at their best, it was when they were bringing their own through, mm. right? And and that when you nurture that process, bringing them through, it takes a while, right? Because mm. it, it wasn't an overnight success for for the Tigers to bring those young guys mm. through where where they won a comp and they and they still done so well for many years there after that, right? Mm. How many years was it like say from two thousand and six to two thousand and twelve? They're always in the top eight, or almost in the top we four. Close. Right? Yeah, I think, I think 2010, 11, we made the semis, but the years before that and that, we're always known as oh, ninth place club. Like, well, that, well, that short of making the semis. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, in 2005, obviously, you're playing at the Sharks, and this is why I'm alluding to this question here. You you copped a a huge hit, right? Mm. You were knocked out, and I know you don't like watching those videos, but I wanted to ask you this question. You see the problem with CT uh, with individuals in the game. I think Mark Carroll came out the other day yeah. and he's got it. And, and, and you know, you look at guys like Roy Simmons and especially the guys from the 80s. How, when you're playing the game back then, obviously you don't, you, you got to be tough, you got to get up. And you mm. talked about it before you were concussed and you didn't even remember a whole game. How, how much do you think, how important is that today? Yeah, like was, with the changes that they've yeah, made. Yeah, I know. It's something they had to do. Um, yeah. I mean, you got to put players' welfare at the front of everything. Um, even sort of, you know, even now, it's it's good that they, anything that looks like a head knock, they got that independent doctor on the TV and they, you know, bring them off for a, um, you know, they check their head and see if they can actually go on the field again or how long, you know, they've got to stay off the field for. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I suppose that generate my generation, like I alluded to before, Sort of, you didn't want to know, let the other team know you're um, you're injured and things like that. But the generations before, man, those hits were brutal. Yeah, you know, hits around the head, and, and obviously you mentioned that that hit that Hopawadi got me from. You know, it was pretty. Um, obviously, I've seen in that. I don't. I don't. Obviously, at the time, I don't remember anything. And I was out for about four weeks after that. Four Just weeks. Delayed concussion. Yeah. Wow. Every time I tried to go exercise, I was getting headaches and things like that. So, um, you know, fingers crossed. It's. There were, I had a few concussions over, over the years of playing, but you know, fingers crossed. Um, head stays all right. It's, it's pretty sad to see some of those ex-players with their um, their, their dementia, issues, you know, yeah, yeah. dementia and, and yeah. things like that. So, um, yeah, I'll, hopefully I'm all right, man. It's it's a bit of the unknown, to be honest. When when that 
so we, we were talking about the delayed concussion. What's that like? I mean, what, what, take us through that process. It's pretty frustrating. Like, obviously, you get concussed. Um, that one was a really bad one. I had to stay overnight in hospital. I was vomiting and stuff. But then I think after a week, you go for light, you get, I was going for light walks. Oh, you, obviously, you, you do all the mental stuff, like the questions, like repeating numbers, things like that. Um, but I, with it was so long ago now. But with the, I remember sort of like a week later, I'd go for a walk or something. I was still getting headaches. All right, we'll put it back a week. So a week later, you sort of you try and do it again. Headaches are still there. I think slowly, as, and as the headaches go, you, you just increase the training lightly. Mm. Um, could be jogging, and then until until there was no symptoms there. But I'd, even now, that the protocols would be even better now. You know, or, mm. but they're probably a lot more research now. That hit today. What would he get? He got seventeen weeks. Oh, seventeen weeks. Yeah, probably get life. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think it was. Um, he pretty much got life. I think his contract got torn up that after that. It, yeah. But he had a lot of um, suspensions before that. Yeah. So. Did you have any sort of bitterness or anything like that towards Hopper after that? Like, did you feel like fuck? You know. Yeah, uh, not really. Like he sort of his. I played with his younger brother in uh, the junior reps on New South Wales. He reached out the next day. His brother rang me up the next day and apologised. And then John John got in contact and that as well. I mean, um, oh look, it wasn't a good shot. It was pretty, yeah. it was pretty bad and that. But you know, after taking for his word that he apologised at the time, and it is what it is. You know. Yeah. Obviously, the game is extremely brutal, right? And you, you have to be a certain type of individual to play. You've got to play with injuries. Mm. Was there any games where you played with a broken hand, dislocated shoulder, and you had to just get through the whole game with that game, mate, you stay on the field? Heaps, mate, heaps. Um, remember, I've dislocated both AC joints in my shoulders. Like, that's where the AC joint pops out. It's painful, man. But well, both times I've done it, like, I was one on each shoulder, and I, I sort of jabbed, jabbed one to continue the game. Like went off, obviously got assessed, and they jabbed it. Um, and after the fear, after the game, the pain was just excruciating on both sides. And I was, I, my, my AC joints pop out on both mm. sides now because of that. You know, but I played for the pain. Um, there was one year I sort of broke my foot, the the, the big ball of your big toe, that that bone there. And um, I think I was out for about six, seven weeks. It just wasn't getting better, and I was I was frustrated. Um, and I decided to needle that for the for how, every game. I was needling it for probably the last ten weeks. So we're in a boot all game. We're we're in one of those moon boots, even to the game, needling it to play, and then just icing it all weekend. We're in the moon boot all week again. Get to game day, and then I'll, I'll you know jab it again. I was just doing things like um, lightweight swimming because I couldn't I couldn't run on it. But mm. um, yeah, it was, that that was that was pretty painful, you know. But and then I had surgery at the end of the year. Um, I dislocated fingers out of the sockets, you know, jabbing them. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of that happens <laughs> when you're playing, man. People. The fans in that probably don't realise, but um, especially towards the end of the year, man, like the 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 doctor's room at the, at the games, there's folks leaning up to get painkillers before every game just to get through the games, you know. It's a brutal sport. So when you're getting these needles and, and you're going through that, do they give you an option to go, hey, you can have surgery or you're gonna get, you can have needles? Um, no, they do. To be honest, they give you the option. Um, mm -hmm. Probably go, alluding to what we are talking about before, mm -hmm. you know, you brought up in that environment. You got to, you know, you're tough. You you play through the pain. And to be honest, it was probably, you know, I suppose if a coach or a, or a doctor is going to go, oh, we can needle it and you can play, you can play through the pain if you want. You're not going to say no because you're brought up in the environment where you yeah. don't want to let your teammate down. They're a player down on the field, and that's just sort of that was my mentality back then. Obviously, and that's you know, I've always been a team player, so yeah. it's just something that come with the territory for me. So, I just want to get a picture of this. You've just finished the game. You've got the needles. You get off. Mm. How long after the needle wears out does an excruciating pain start to begin? Yeah, um, probably a couple of hours. Or maybe remember that night. I remember. So the AC joints on the shoulders. That was um, that was excruciating pain, man. That was probably an hour or two. Like once that wore off, that was that, that was pretty sore. The foot. I just had a routine where I'd play the game. I'd just sit in an ice bucket at home. Have a bucket. I'd ice my foot every sort of 10, 15 minutes. Elevate it. Um, that happened for about ten weeks, I'd say. But um, yeah, looking back, man, that was just sort of part and parcel of the game. Mm. Like looking back at your footy career, it's something you forget. But when you look back at it, yeah, man, I've probably I wouldn't know how many needles I've paid to get to get through the pain of games. Wow. The, the the reason I ask is what kind of mentality 
do you need to have in order to do that? Is that inbuilt or is that part of you go into this culture and this is how we do everything and you just have to soak that culture up and become part of that? I think like the culture builds you to be that sort of guy. I don't think they hold a needle at you and go, you got to play, you, you got to play, you got to do that. They give you the option, but I think footy players are, are pretty, generally speaking, most footy players, the vast majority are, are tough guys. Yeah. And they're going to, they're going to do whatever they can to, um, to get on the field to play. But I don't think you're going to play with a pain, like my painkiller could have made the injury worse. Hmm. So that's why I had those, when I played, I wasn't going to play with a pain, painkiller if it was going to make, make anything worse. But, hmm. um, you know, it's just, it's just, it is what it is, man. There, there would have been, even right now, there'd be players playing with a lot of those sort of painkillers to yeah. get free games. Who is, who is, who are some of the toughest players you've seen where you go, I can't believe that guy's still on the field with what he's got? Yeah, geez. Huh? It's a good question, man. There's probably heaps of them, eh? Um, you put me on the spot. There's, I just, I just remember guys playing with injuries all, all the time. Yeah. Um, Bryce Gibbs was a madman. He was my front row opponent. He, he, he took the game, he took the field. He injured a fair, fair few times. Um, but even like um, like Sam Burgess, remember him in the oh man, he's, that, he's, that South Square final. Yeah, like, man, that that's that's that was brutal. Like what happened to him and for him to to so I grew up on that legend of Scott Seller. You know, Scott yeah, Seller yes. played the grand final with yeah. the broken jaw. Yeah, and um, he obviously was before my time, but everyone talks about how tough he was. And that's when you grow up, you go, oh, look, John, everyone talks about rugby league players being tough. And John Sattler was the, the top of that, you know. And then to see what Sam Burgess done in that, that grand final, he's probably a modern day John Sattler. Like he's, he's one of the toughest men I've probably played against, Sam Burgess. And that proved how tough he was playing with that broken jaw. <laughs> well, I look at a lot of players that they finish their career and they're almost, some of them are lost without the game. Mm. Because think about it, like, you know, you said that was the culture. That's what you do. That's who you are. That's, yep. you know, you got to play with injuries. you gotta, you got to put the work in. Think about it, right? You, th this is what you just said. When then, then you look at certain players when they finish the game. Mm. It's like they go, and do you see this often, where they go, I don't even know who the fuck I am anymore. I've lost my, I don't know my identity. Mm. Does that happen a lot in the game? I think so. Like, I, th I think... Um Pretty hard. Like obviously, you're when you're a footy player. Yeah, it's tough. Oh well, yeah, you you know you do get a lot of money. You get the the fame if you enjoy it, all that sort of stuff. The money's good. Um, you get told to be training at this time. You pretty much everything's just in a script for you. You got to be here. You got to be there. You got to be there. All you got to do is put the work in and be tough. Turn up fit. All that sort of stuff. I think when you retire, um, you're not in that environment anymore. If you've straight out of school in that environment where everything's set out for you. Yeah, you got to work hard and you got to be, you know, you got to be tough and all that sort of stuff, but everything's there for you, you know. And then um, when you when you leave that environment, you got to go out on your own. I guess a lot of players do struggle, you know. It's um, the money drops, you know, you you might be jobless or you got to find a job you don't really necessarily enjoy doing, um, things like that. So I know, I know a fair few players struggle with it. What you've done extremely well, and I've seen photos of you, you finished your career, you've kept extremely fit. How important is it for players who finish to stay fit and look after themselves and feel good? Yeah, but it's, it's something I enjoy doing. Um, obviously, I, there was something I did for a living, like nest, pretty much keep fit, train. That was part of my thing. And um, to be honest, I do it for my mental health as well. I, I train. I have to do something. I have to train. Otherwise, it just clears things in my head. You know, it's mm. mentally, it's it's probably the best thing for me. Um, but. I think a lot of players, you know, you get that saying, a lot of players retire, they, they give up training, they put on weight, they drink too much beer. Um, I just didn't want to go down that path, you know. I wanted to keep fit, keep healthy. And um, I think you get a lot more out of life when you're feeling feeling fit and healthy, eh? You'd have to be one of the guys that's in the best shape after. You're, you're in better shape now <laughs> than when you played. Because yeah. I was watching the uh, – I've seen one of the photos of um, Cooper who played for the Dragons, the centre. Mm. Mate, that guy used to have a mad body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to put him down, but what yeah. I'm saying is you're, you're a front row. You look like you're in the best shape of your life. Like, no, no I've seen the photos of your top off. Mate. You look <laughs> in great shape. Yeah. Like, to f first of all, you can look fit or mm. look fit and train, but you've taken it a, a level above that. Yeah, but it's just something I enjoy. Like, if I, um, honestly, if I don't, if I don't do something every day, 
I'm, I'm dirty myself. It's just mm. something I love doing. I love training. Like you, you've seen me. I come in here every now and then and keep fitting. I love. I just love training. Um, you got your gym bag. That's your gym. Yeah, bag, I'm right? ready yeah. to do a session after this, <laughs> man. Same. So, um, yeah, I just love that lifestyle, man. Um, yeah. To be honest, like when I like when I finished footy, um, got divorced. I was having a few like having issues with their mum. Like I wasn't seeing the kids, man. It's keep my head, keep my head sane. I'll, I'll train. Yeah. You know, when I when I learned that that's that's the best way to deal with stuff, it became a routine, and I. I just started um, hitting the gym all the time and exercising. Um, I just get more out of life, man. I feel better when I'm when I'm keeping fit. So I've just I've just kept it a habit now. Yeah. I, don't, I just don't want to let myself go. And like I said, mentally, man, it's it's uh, it's the best thing for me. So obviously, you're pretty clean. Yeah. You know, to look after yourself. I've seen a few photos where you're in the gym, you're in the garage with your kids. Uh, obviously, you're a great role model by doing that. You're showing them, mm. you know, uh, healthy. Um, disciplines that they can take on in their life. Are your kids huge in sports? Do they love the, the game? Do they watch a lot of your games now? Yeah. Or, or they want to play the game themselves? They do. Like, I've got a boy and a girl. Um, my son's nine. He played his first year of league this year that just passed was his first year. He's he's um he's starting to get right into it, um, asking questions. Like, um, they always try and put on – we can watch you. I said, oh, you got to jump on YouTube. There might be a few <laughs> clips from years ago on there. But um, and my, daughter, my daughter's, um, she's pretty girly. She likes dancing and gymnastics and things like that. But um, I went, I went to their, uh, I went to pick them up early from school the other the other week and a few a few kids ran over to get my autograph and uh, things like that, like young kids. And uh, my daughter was loving it, saying, like, going around saying, oh, my dad's famous, all this sort of stuff. <laughs> I, I said, no, I'm not, darling. I'm, I'm you know, old news, but... Um, you know, I think that now that are an age where they they know what I what I did and you know I played, but how I played and what I did and um, you know I, sh- I I want to show them that 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 lifestyle where you keep fit, you exercise. Like I take them to the beach, I, I take them in the gym at home, um, just trying to keep them active. You know, set a, set a good set a good image for them. How did you feel when the kids ran up to you? Oh, I was, <laughs> right, man, I, I was cute. I was just uh, yeah. I think my daughter was a bit in awe. You know, she was like smiling and she was pretty happy. Um, I was telling the kids, you know, you sure your autograph? It's been a long time since I played. It was probably before you were even born, so yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty <laughs> cute though. So, you know, you finished the game um, in 2018, lead Rhinos. What was that experience like in England? Did you, did you have you had the kids while you were in England, right? Yeah. So my son was um, was one when we moved over there. Uh, my daughter was born over there, so she was she's got a British passport. Um, mm-hmm. So she's got Jewel. My son sort of, he started preschool there, so he's sort of developing a little English accent as well. Um, yeah, it was pretty good, man. Like, um, it was hard. It was tough. Like, the, the woman I was with at the time, she's, um, you know, we're not together anymore, mm. so things like that were a bit tough over there. But, um, you know, it was, good, it, was good, it was a good environment, man. I learned, um, you know, in getting engulfed in a different culture, like all these other countries was close by. The people were lovely up there. I was in the north of England, man. People are real solid there, sort of people. Met yeah. some really good people and uh, no, it was good. It was, it was fun. What was that? Two seasons you were over there, right? Yeah, so I was signed for three years. Um, the first year I played, I snapped my Achilles wow. right right near the end. It was it was a few days after my daughter was born, actually. Like I played, like hardly slept because you know, and I ended end up playing, which I probably should have just told the told the coach I'm not playing. But that was yeah. that team first situation where went out played. I was lack of sleep and, and my Achilles went, so I sort of ruptured my Achilles. Had yeah. to have surgery. Um, Came back, got that done, came back to Australia for a bit, did all the rehab and came back the next year. And then um, I, was, I was going good again. I was feeling fit. You know, I was coming through. Like, I, you know, I was playing for a few months and starting to feel good again. Then the other one went on me. The other Achilles ruptured, you know. Wow. So that's pretty, pretty too sort of, uh, everyone knows Achilles rupture is one of the most yeah. hardest injuries to, to come back from and a long recovery. So both of them went and had one more year to go and I just decided to call it quits after after those two years, you know. I think I was. I think I was a bit footied out as well, to be honest. Like yeah. I just had. I had other stuff going on in my life, and uh, I was over there in England. I said, oh, you know, I just want to get back to Australia and things like that. So yeah. Look, the Achilles, and to do two, is probably one of the most severe injuries mm. to come back from. What was your mindset at that point? The first one, I was like, no, nah, I, I want to come back from this. You know, I could. Want to? I want to work hard to get back from this. You know, I, I don't want to quit. I'm going to come back. The second one went, uh, got back, I actually got back. I started feeling really good. I was, you know, I was training hard. Um, I, was, I was starting to play good footy and then thought, you know, I've done well. I've come back from this. And then then the other one went, man, and um, that was that was a pretty brutal 
brutal blow, you know, and, and I'd been playing for, what was it, um, 15 years already, you know, mm. and I was thinking, like, is this my body telling me I'm done, you know, this and that, and mentally I was, I was struggling a bit with it, to be honest, and then um, I went there, and then I just, after a while, like, I, I, just, I started training and doing the rehab, and I was, um, it was, it was tough, man, I was like, um, I was in England on my own, the kids were back in Australia, I was missing the kids, there was a lot mm. of things happening away from footy, so I thought, Ah, this isn't the place for me, man. I want to mm. get back home, and I decided to retire then and there. When you look at the game, <clears throat> you, 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 you know, I talked to a few rugby league managers. Everyone wants to be able to um, become a first-grade rugby league player. What kind of an individual does it take to go to that level? Because sometimes you see dads and parents go, you know, my kid's the best, you know, mm. that you know they can do this, they can do that. But what does it actually take to be an NRL player? Because the average lifespan is like 10 games yep. of an NRL player. You went 210, 42 for the Rhinos. What is it? What kind of mentality does an individual need? Or well, what would you say to your son who wants to um, go to that next level and play rugby league? Yeah, it's, it's obviously you've got to be dedicated. Um, not, it's probably not him. He's only nine. Obviously, he's got to enjoy the game. First and foremost, as a kid that age, you've got to enjoy the game. And I think as you get older... You know, the older you get, you know, 13, 14, you just got to start to being dedicated um, and keep getting older. You just got to be focused, dedicated. Um, you don't get, you don't give up. Like, you know, I remember those training sessions, the 14, 15-year-old, I was looking, coming into Matthews Cup, which was under 16s. We started getting, training used to be really hard, you know. You hmm. couldn't give up. You had that mentality where you can't give up. And I think that's that's all part of the process of of getting there, you know. And um, as you get older, you got to, there's distractions along the way, you know. Hmm. Obviously, injuries come into it too. I've seen some good young players that were cracking players, you know, and unfortunately, injuries got in the way. But um, it's just the de dedication to the graft, you know. You got to you got to turn up. You got to be punctual. You got to in a team sport. You got to put it. You got to be a team first sort of player. Um, I think a lot of these individual blokes that sort of just think of themselves first and things like that. So you, you know, you're going into battle together. So you got to have that team first mentality, and um, you don't want to let anyone down. Hmm. I think I had that mentality from a young age. You know, you talk about like you, there was a lot of great players that didn't make it. Was it because those players didn't have the mentality of how how to play with injuries or how to come back from rehab? What was it that within those individuals that you you saw that they just didn't have that edge? Yeah, it could make, it's probably a bit of that. They probably didn't have that mentality where they they'll push through pain, they'll push through um, things got too hard for them. Um, I I I made some really good players when we were kids, but you know they decided to just get on the drink and the drugs and all that at a young age and things like that. So, um, man, I think it's like even like a under-16s team or Australian schoolboys team, even from those levels, there's, there's only a few a handful of guys that make it. So it's, mm. it is very hard to to, to, to get there. Mm. And, I, you know, I was saying to you earlier on, I used to look up at guys that had played like one first-grade game or two first-grade, and I used to like, oh, man, this bloke's played, played for the Dragons or he's played for whoever, you know. And um, to make it, you just got you got to – you got to train hard, you know. When when you're going through your teenage years and eighteen, you've there's so many things that will distract you from the game. You got to stay focused on that goal, and um, I mean, you can have a life outside of football, but if you want to make it, man, you got to you got to give it your all. If you look at you know whether it's business, whether you look at life, sport, um, there's always outside distractions. In rugby league, I'm assuming I'm not assuming actually you see it a lot, but women. Mm women become a big distraction because everyone wants to be with whoever's, you know, at the top mm. of their game, in the league, um, alcohol we just talked about, and drugs. Mm. Obviously, this has a huge effect on players. How does that get managed by teams, by coaches? How does it get managed internally to make sure that you bring these guys back in, into the right area or it does it get mismanaged? Yeah, well, I think um – are you talking about in the first grade environment? Things first like that? grade, yeah. But yeah. I mean, I guess this would happen all the way from yeah under twenties. You know, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean, like you got a 19, 18, 18 or a nineteen year old or a twenty year old, mm. they, they're veering towards the women, yeah, yeah. right? But coming in the first grade, there's going to be more, yeah, yeah, more distractions. There's going to be more of everything. How does that get handled internally? Well, every club's pretty good now. They got welfare welfare um, officers at the club who. Aren't on the coaching staff, and and they're guys that you can talk to about issues, and it's pretty confidential and things like that. So th those guys look out for you and help you, and um, 
even most of the coaches are all pretty pretty good guys too. Mm. You know, I think um, with the drinking and that, I think they'll you know they might if if you get caught turning up drunk or you know they'll give you a warning and then they'll keep monitoring you. But if you're if you blow, it's ultimately if you, if you if you're going to go down that path, you you'll blow it for yourself. Hmm. You know what I mean? That's what I said to make it. You got to be that focused. You can't let those sort of distractions get a hold of you. You would have seen a lot of that happen, though, in mm -hmm. your career. You would have seen a lot of guys go, "Fuck, he's he's gone after this one. Mm -hmm. He's gone after that one." Did, did you ever see individuals, and it could be different teams, where the distractions really got the better of them? Yes, sort of. Like, a, um, to a degree, man. There was not. There was there was a few players over the years that sort of like just you know maybe piss their piss their career away just through alcohol or hmm. just not turning up to training and things like that. Um, but I remember early in early in my career, man, when I first came into the Sharks, back in those days, it was a big drinking culture as well. Mm. So that was part and parcel of the game. Yeah, I remember the Sharks like turning up to training on a. I think we just got beat pretty bad, and I turned up. We turned up to training on the Tuesday. The coach just goes, um, "Go home, come back in two hours." Wear your worst kit, and a bus would come pick us up. We'd, all, we'd go, we'd go instead of training, we we're down at a pub drinking all over. That what, was just part of the culture. That? that was like team bonding, you know. That was yeah. the way it was back then. Yeah. Where the game's changed a lot, by, a lot, a lot now. So, um, well, think about it. Back then, you didn't have phones, you didn't have social media, you didn't have any of that. Yeah. So the pressures were probably different. You didn't have yeah. to worry about this person taking a yeah. photo, that person taking yeah. a photo. I mean, the only people you had to worry about was. The newspapers, right? Yeah, but nothing else outside of that. No, yeah, well, like you said, man, there was no, there was none of these people taking photos of you when you're out. Um, even social media now, man. Like, if you're on, if you're on these Twitters and Instagrams and that, everyone's got access to you. Mm. Like, they can message you. I keep my life a lot more private these days, you know. Like, I sort of keep a lot of things private. I've sort of just realised that in the past year. But um, when I was, I wish I was a bit more like this when I was playing. Like if you played a game you didn't play too well, man, you you get you get all these people on Twitter going, you're hopeless, you're you know, mm. you're a waste of money, you're this that. If you let it get to your head, man, it can affect you. All these people have access into your life because you're all on all these social media sites, and um, I think that's the one one thing that players have got to learn that um, these blokes are sitting at home on the couch. Yeah, they're fans. They pay. They, they might pay their money to watch their game, but they're not doing what you're doing. They're not mm. on the field. Um, they're right to their opinion, but don't don't take it to heart. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, I think what people have to realise is more people will clap you on when you're down mm. and hardly anyone will clap when you're up, Yeah. right? So when you're down, they're going to come after you and they're going to push the limits of how far down they can take you. Sport is brutal. Like I've, mm. I've watched that uh, the David Beckham special. When you lose, mate, everyone's after you. Your supporters, yeah. mm. every single person's really trying to take you down and they're mean and they're tough. Did you guys cop any top of that backlash when you were at the Tigers? Yeah, a hundred percent, man. Um, yeah, if we're getting beat in that, like Tigers fan, mate, I'm, I'm not going to mock them. They're awesome fans in that. Like mm. even the guys that are t the fans that turn in, even the way we've been going the past few years, they still turn up and support their. Team. I can't believe that. I mean, I was watching. Is it coming last? Like mm. Oval, yeah. it's almost packed. Yeah, and I'm going like I go for Manly. Yeah, there'd be no one there. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, well, Manly is a nice area, man, but there's something about Leichhardt Oval. It's, you know, there's pe people turn up. I think it's probably a day out for a lot of people too, but mm. the fans are passionate, man. Um, that's what I mean. They do turn up. They um, they support their team. It must be hard to watch them, but it can. some supporters can get ugly, man. Mm. Like they, they can sing you out. They can boo. They boo you. They jump on. Um, like I've seen players, you know, players that play now. Like some players cop messages in there. Like they have a bad game and, threats to them and their families and, and racist comments. It's just it's just disgraceful some of the some of the crap that players have to put up with. Glad yeah. it's not it's not that often, but it, it does happen, you know. Some it gives it gives all these fans access access to you, like a direct message to you and whatever it is. And um you just players are just gotta learn not to uh, not to take it to heart or just not even read it. Yeah, look I've never understood how people waste their time and energy in doing that to any individual, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know I don't condone anything like that. What do you guys do when that when that happens, when the fans are coming after the club, they're coming after different individuals. How do you do? You just all get around each other and go, "Listen, we're not gonna, we're not gonna let that affect us." What happens yeah. in that environment? Yeah, you, you always, you know, you always got each other's back. You, um, no, no one wants to be coming last. No one wants to lose mm -hmm. games. I think, um, I think if the efforts there, that's what I always, always used to say. If, if, if our efforts there and we've tried our best, we'll walk off. We've mm -hmm. tried our best. 
but you, you can't you can't give up on plays. You can't just quit and things like that. So, you know, you might, Tigers. To be fair, they haven't got the roster other teams have got. Mm. So it is hard. But if their efforts, they've had a few games where the efforts been there. They've tried hard. That's all you can ask for. Um, but if, if if you're giving up, you're quitting things like that. That's a no go. You know. Yeah. When you <clears throat> obviously Tim Sheens was the, the coach that you played for the for the longest. Mm. Coaching is a tough gig. You're copping mm. it hard. Mm. The media's coming after you. Everyone's coming after you. Obviously, um, he went back into coaching uh, this year, and they came after him again. When you look at that, do you ever go to yourself? Fuck, who the hell would want to be a coach? <laughs> yeah, probably, man. It's um, yeah, it, it is tough. I think I think they they feel it more than the players. I think um, their head's always on the line. You know, when when um teams losing, it's always mentioned all the coaches' heads on the line. Uh, it'd be a tough gig, man. And I'd have to, I think you'd have to learn to de stress and and not take mm. too much on, man, because um. Yeah, you, you probably affect your sleep and everything if you if you're worrying about it too much. Do you ever say that when you went into training or after a game, or the coach is copying it? Did you ever look at him and go, "Fuck, is he okay?" Um, well, I said Shinzi for most of my career. He's he, yeah, he's got that much experience and runs on the board. He always he, he was always he was always good and you know looked after his players. You know, just worry about what's happening in these four walls sort of mentality and. Um, he was pretty good at that, like sheltering us from all the crap that was, mm. you know, was going on from ex- externally. So, um, generally speaking, Shinzi was really good. Yeah. How hard is it? Like, obviously, when you finished your career, you didn't. You said you didn't watch footy for two years. Yeah, I sort of. Um, what happened there? Yeah, mate. It's it's probably. Uh, I was over in England for a couple of years. Um, I said before, like, I had other stuff going on outside of footy, and um, I had those bad injuries and. Um, I think I was just over footy towards the end, you know. It was just, um, I'd had enough, you know. I got, you go everywhere, people would be asking about footy. And it was it, I, it was a point where everywhere you go, you go down and get a coffee at the local cafe, everyone's talking about footy. Everywhere you go, it's just all footy talk, man. I just, I was just ready to get away from it. I didn't really watch the game for a couple of years, hardly watched any footy. And um, that's changed now. Like, I've, hmm. you know, I found my sort of passion and really enjoying it again. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. I just, I've been doing it for so long and, I just wanted a mental break. I was ready for the next sort of part of my life, you know, and to move on from it all. Yeah. Um, when you're looking at it now and say your son says, Dad, I want to go for it, is it, does it motivate you now to go, hey, fuck, I you know, I've been away for for a while. Mm-hmm. I don't mind maybe, you know, working with teams and mm. possibly, you know, being a trainer. I mean, you're in great shape or working with coaching stuff. Would that ever interest you? Yeah, I think son. I think I think it would, man. Um, I'd probably I'd probably enjoy coaching like kids or helping kids get through the grades and you know things like that. Um, yeah, I like I like, I like training and that sort of stuff. Um, I don't think I, I don't think I'd, I'd like the the mental. Um, how can I describe it? Like the mental the stress the mental the stress of uh of coaching a high a high team and things like that. Um, I wasn't a massive footy head to play with, to be honest. I think most of these coaches that are coaching now are guys that lived and breathed footy. Guys that would, you know, they'd play their game and they'd watch every other game on the weekend. Hmm. I was never like that, man. I'd, I, I, um, I think like sort of footy nerds, you know, like to, hmm. to be a coach. Then they're, they're not nerds, but they just love footy that much. Um, yeah, maybe like I always thought when I finished footy, I'd, I'd maybe get into the, uh, you know, like the welfare officer hmm. job thing, things like that, helping kids with issues and things like that. That was more sort of my thing if I was going to stay in the game. But um, yeah, I'd, you know, I would, I'd, I'd be happy to help out or, or um. In, with anything like with with welfare or with uh with with training things like that yeah. these days yeah speaking of you like when i look at you i, I go you definitely do well in that welfare area where you'd probably be able to be a role model to the young players coming through on a, how to handle tough situations pressure situations obviously you've got that experience you've come from an era where you knew what the players there done before that and what what it's like now through social media and being out there where people can really come after you and be nasty mm. that would probably be I, I could see you doing that how how has how when you look at the game do you still watch it do you watch it like a fan now or do you watch it like geez that could be better like what is it um, what is it that you look at now yeah sort of i watch it like a i watch it like a fan man the game's um 
it's changed a little bit, but in essence, it's just the same shape ball, the same amount of players, the same the same size of the field and everything. Um, saying that, man, that grand final that just happened, that was probably the best game I've seen in, in years, man. That was unbelievable. Um, that was the best game of the, or the best game of the year, and it was the grand final. So it was, um, yeah. But I, just, I sort of just sit back and when I go for the Tigers, it's hard. It's sort of hard to, to sit yeah. in on the edge of your chair and, and <laughs> you know and hoping they win. But um, yeah, I mate, feel it, sorry for you. Uh, <laughs> Hey, listen, can they get any worse? That's the question I want to ask you. No, they can't get worse, can they? They, they were last, <laughs> were they? You can't, has anyone done it three years in a row? Oh, don't go there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you no. know, like ben, Benji's there. You know what? The, I don't they, go for the Tigers and I don't yeah. even want to see them come last. No, I, I, don't think, I think it's one of those clubs where no one hates them, no one dislikes mm. them. It's just... um. Mate, I hope, like, there's some good young kids coming through. Mm. I, just, I just sort of hope it all clicks, you know. It's just hard. Like, a club like the Tigers... A lot of like if they were to sign a player, it's 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 hard to attract players the way we are at the moment. They say you got to lose a grand final to win a grand final. Mm. The way Brisbane lost, is that the worst way to lose when you've yeah, got I'd, the I'd game? Say so. Like, like wouldn't you rather be would, look, from a player's perspective? Would you rather be blown off the park or lose like that? Um, yeah, this it's because it was the grand final. Maybe you, those Brisbane players probably had that feeling that we've done this. We get we're gonna we're gonna get this, and then it was just taken from mm. them. And on the flip side, you're just blown away. If you're blown away, you know you weren't good enough. Mm. It's it's hard, man. Like if they they knew they put the effort in Brisbane. They just stuffed up for that last twenty minutes or turn the, turn the foot off the pedal or, or or whatever. Where um, it's a hard question, man. I, was, I think they would have been happy with the efforts and what they did, but it's 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 a fuck. It's a hard way to lose, man. How long? Would, how long does something like that wear on the minds of the players? Do they get over it quick? Is it something that's going to go into next season? And you know, like obviously, Penrith were kind of lucky when they lost the grand final. They've won three in a row. Mm. How hard is it to come back the next year and win? And you like they always say you got to take your opportunities. It's yeah. not easy to say hey, you got to lose one to win one, right? Yeah, I think I think that's just a figure of speech, isn't it? Like it's mm. it's probably. Something Brisbane will look like, you know, they, they should look. They've got a Brisbane, that team Brisbane have got, there's so many good young kids there. Mm. But that system that Penrith's got at the moment, I think it yeah. was this year or last year, they won every grade. They won the, I think they won all, every grade going through. And they just seem to be producing kid after kid after kid. And the thing about Penrith is they don't go out and they don't, they don't, get, don't sign superstars. Yeah. It's all bred internally. They might get a kid from the country or from, from the bush or something at a, at a young age. But they're not—they're not—they're not stealing all these kids or you know guns from other teams. I, I read—I think I heard something that they haven't signed a state of origin player in years, Penrith. Yeah. And look, all their origin players are a homegrown, homegrown talent, you know. So um, they deserve it, man. What what they've done, what they've done in that club, and how many local juniors come through and are in that team, mm. you know, you got to take your hats off to them. They—they they deserve to be where they are. Look, and Brisbane are losing a few good players for uh, next year. And when you when you you're right, what you said about Penrith. They've got an unbelievable nursery and a system mm. that keeps bringing players through. Like they lost a few players last year, great players, mm. and they win again this year. Again this year, they're losing more players, mm. cool. and they keep they obviously keep winning. When you look at rugby league, like, I'm going to ask you this question: Is how important is it to build through rather than go out and buy? How important is that? And no, how I... how hard is that? Like mm. like we're seeing Penrith do that now. And obviously, if you look at, you know, teams like Brisbane from the past, and if you look mm. at if you look at some of the great teams, mm. it was the players they bought through yeah. that made the club. Yeah. How hard is it to do something like Penrith or replicate that? Oh, I'd be like, I guess Penrith are blessed. They've they've probably got the biggest nursery in probably in, in maybe in the world or in mm. Australia. Like in terms of their their district, like it's a it's a big it's a big area. It's working class. A lot of kids play rugby league out there, but these kids would have grown up. Wanting to play for Penrith, loving Penrith, so, so I guess when they put that jersey on, they've probably got that extra, mm. extra passion in, in, in their blood, you know, about playing for the club. Um, but yeah, I think that's the way up. I, th I think, that, you know, going back to the Tigers, I think they've got to hone in on that their local area, um, especially that Campbelltown region. Like it's this huge. huge man. It's same sort of demographics as, as Western City, like it's West, as Penrith and places like that. Man, there's there's so many kids out there playing. If they can bring all these kids up in areas like that and, you know, wanting to play for the Tigers, then, uh, 
you know, that's the way to go. You can't just get players from here, players from there, and try and, and try and buy comms. Although some clubs have done it over the years, mm. you know. Well, the, well, this is my next question. When you look at that, right, and you look at management managers, mm. right, that are rugby league managers for the players, do they have too much of a slice of the pie and not bringing the players through because it's not their it's not their guy into the club? Because you hear about it a lot, where yeah. You know, that it has to suit what the managers want mm. and who they're going to bring into the club. Where where you look at Penrith, they've they've put the system where they've got the managers out there bringing them through mm. the juniors. Is it is, is there is there a problem with that when you look at the Tigers or you even look at other clubs? Do they have certain managers there that that ruin it? Um, are you, are you talking about player managers? Player or? managers, yeah. Yeah, it's. I suppose that's their that's their job and that. I, I guess when, you know, I've heard, I've read those things and heard those things that you know, the manager might have the coach, they might have you know, a heap of players in their books and that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's hard to say, man. Like, no, someone like that shouldn't have too much power. Hmm. But um, yeah, I sort of I I don't know how that system works, and you know, it's all hearsay in the media and stuff like that. So, yeah. but um, yeah, no player manager should have that much power where they dictate, they tell a club you can or can't have this player. Yeah. They they should be working for a player individually, not because they have four or five guys at the one club. Yeah, but it happens. I know it happens. Yeah, that's why I asked the question because obviously, in everything in sport and mm. everything, there's a lot of politics, mm. right? There's a lot of different factions. When you got the West, the West Tigers, you got two different clubs, mm. right? And you've got one with this perspective and this point of view and then you've got one with this point of view mm. how do they how do they, how do they marry that up because it happens everywhere mm. like you look at you know when, when you're in a relationship mm. it's the same thing right yeah if you don't get along it makes it hard and you've got to find a happy medium does that does that kind of th thing affect clubs because people say people say they come out in the media go no nah, none of that's that affects the clubs the four walls like you said mm. before but surely it's got to have some sort of effect yeah yeah, it, it would. Probably more so today than probably back in your day. You yeah. were more sheltered. They said, yeah. hey, guys, do your job. We'll yeah. handle the rest. Well, I think I think with the, you know, you mentioned the Tigers in t terms of, you know, there's the west side and the Balmain side. It's the same with the Dragons. The yeah, St. George yeah. and Illawarra. Yeah, yeah. Um, you just, I suppose you're under the West Tigers banner. So you've just got to, you've got to come in and just buy into the, mm. to what's happening. You know, you do have these historical links to those past clubs, but it is what it is right now. If you want to be the West Tigers, everyone's got to get on board. The same as the Dragons, yeah. St George and Illawarra, they're one club now. Yeah. You got to, it's it's like anything, like you know, board board meetings. There's people on this side and this side, and you know, for anything to be successful, you got to heap, you got to find that, you know, you got to you you got to group up and be on the same same wavelength and um, find that happy medium where everyone's going to um, work hard together and, and get things done. Keith, what it sounds like to me is you got to go back to the the Tigers. They need someone like you, <laughs> huh? <laughs> ah, I'm all right, mate. Remove the politics, <laughs> clean it up, and say, "Hey, let's fucking get along. Yeah. We're gonna get these players. We yeah. need the juniors from you. You got the whole plan there." Oh, mate, no, nah, there's but not. There's, well, mate, they're, they're, they're not a lot more than me, man. I'm just, um, I'm just looking from afar now. Mate, so. everything you said was on the money. Yeah, right. It was on the money. Um, finally, you've, you've obviously, you, you've, you know, been out of the game for a while. You, you, you're a fan again. Um, what are you doing now, and what what does the future look like for you? Yeah, right now, man, I'm just um, I'm, I'm just working, man. I work work on the docks down at Port Bonny there yeah. as a wharfie. Um, you know, father of two, obviously. Um, enjoy enjoy my time with them. Um, just keep it fit and healthy, man. Like mm. just trying to trying to enjoy life, you know. A bit, yeah. bit more older and sensible now, so um, just I just live a simple life now, man. Just just enjoying life, surround myself with good people, and just enjoy life. As you get older, obviously the mindset's completely different. This is my final question. How important is like you, you've got, you know, you can see things completely different now in your life, right? If you had this head on a young 20-year-old, mm. what would be different? Yeah, a few things would be different, obviously. You know, you, mm. know, you know, at that age, you think you're bulletproof, you know everything, mm. you know, and then right now, like looking back, man, um, probably, obviously I would have done a lot more I would have kept my body in better shape, you know. I probably wouldn't have um, would have eaten better. I would have drank drank less alcohol. Um, in in terms of footy, but even even in life, man, I would have um, just like filtered out crap people, you know, like um, surrounded myself with better people, mm. you know, and just um, 
even, even like educationally, man, like when I played footy, there was all these chances to do courses and things like that. I never really took them on, you know. Mm. Done a few little things, but yeah, I, think, I guess you just, you know, as you get older, you, you know, you look back and well, I've got no regrets in life, man. Like yeah. it is what it is, but I've, yeah. li- I've lived a good life. But um, looking back, there, there would have been a few things I would have, I would have changed along the yeah. way. And the reason I ask that is because, you know, like it's, it's, I get asked a lot what I would have done differently and it's exactly what you said. Mm-hmm. It's exactly what you said. You know, I would have probably, you know, like if you look at, you know, I started, you know, in the fitness industry when I was 21 and I had great blocks of discipline, but I didn't have full seasons of it. Mm. Right. And sometimes when I look back, I go, fuck, you can actually do a lot when you're young if you've got someone that's right in your corner that understands what mm. it takes. From that perspective, exactly what you said. And that's why when I when I talk to a lot of young kids and they ask me like what I probably would, would do differently, it's probably the wisdom that we have and what we've been through mm. of going, hey, fuck, man, we, we could have done a lot more different. And I think young people shouldn't waste what mm. they've got and they should get rid of this, the, the individuals around them they're going to take them down the wrong path. Like you said before, there was great pathways in rugby league that, mm. you know, we could have all taken advantage of. Like even yeah. myself, there's so many different things we could have taken advantage of. And I guess that comes with age. But when you look back at it, we could have made a better decision at the time as well. Yeah. 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 I think I think that's sort of, you know, my advice to any young kid was probably just surround yourself with, with good people people that are meant to you and help you through through life, you know, like in terms of rugby league or career or anything, you know, because you are who you hang out with as well, mm. you know. If you if you, if you you hang out with the right people, good people, you're going to be yeah. a good person. But if you hang around with crap and shit, you're going to turn to shit, aren't you? It's funny. I, sometimes I cop a lot of shit on that when I talk about it. You're the sum of the five. You're the sum of the four. Whether they're, you know, idiots, you're the sum of the four idiots. Whether they're good, you're the sum of the four. Mm. Whether they're smart, you're the sum of the four or the five. And sometimes I cop shit because people go, everyone thinks they're perfect, you know, yeah. if they're your friend. I was, what's wrong with me? But the reality is that is how it works. Yeah. If you're around the wrong people, you are going to be that fourth or fifth one. Yeah. And people have to understand that that, that is by no way – something that's been pulled out of the sky Mm. that is true and it's a reflection of people taking inventory of their circle and Mm. asking themselves is this the right place is this the right circle like you got kids Mm. you wouldn't want to be want them to be around in the wrong circle i've got kids as well Mm. and it does have an effect it has an effect on your performance and your life and your choices you make Mm. right and i think it's extremely important but uh and i just want to thank you for coming down today no worries, brother. Had a great man. chat. Good and chat. Um, I don't know if I asked tough enough questions. I think I went pretty hard. No, it was hard. good, man. Huh? Yeah, that was pretty, I went pretty too tough. hard, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but hard enough to push yeah. you around. Yeah, that was good, man. Uh, all right, brother. Thanks, right, thanks, thanks, thanks again. Sweet. Thanks.